Hi everyone and welcome to the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. My name's Emily Rodin and we're so happy that you could join us. Although we've been closed due to COVID-19, we've been hard at work on new exhibits here and we can't wait to show you around. First, I'd like to share a little bit about the project background. An exhibit committee was formed of Los Serenos docents and city staff in late 2018. Around that time, we're also completing the installation of the Point Vicente Lighthouse Fresnel Lens and Whaling exhibit here at PVIC, the first noteworthy exhibit changes since our expansion in 2006. With our latest additions, the goal was to create a fun and interactive experience for all. Paul Port, our exhibit designer and committee member, will be taking you through the exhibits. We hope to see you in person once the museum is permitted to reopen. And lastly, on behalf of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, we'd like to thank Los Serenos de Point Vicente for their generous contribution, which made these exhibits possible. Hi, I'm Paul Port, and I'm a docent here at the Interpretive Center. And I thought I'd give you a little preview of what you're gonna be seeing today. And the first panel is talking about the world in motion. And the world in motion is really about how we as people and animals need to migrate and move because of climate, because of water, because of food, and because of habitat. So we're always in motion. So then this first display really talks about that really well. And you can see that we have the animals and the insects that are always in motion. Now, if you pan up to here, you're going to see this is part of a sailing ship that came through here probably in 1540 about, even though this is not original. But you can imagine the local people that lived here 13 to 15,000 years ago to see a ship like that coming into the harbor. And if you pan through, you're going to see, you're going to notice the California currents. And the currents really impacted how people came to this area because the only way that they could get here virtually in the beginning was either on land or in light boats or canoes. Now what's special about this area too coming through here is that they used birds, clouds, currents, stars, cross staff, and chip logs amongst other things in order to navigate these waters. Um, the first people we're here around 13 to 14, maybe 15,000 years ago. And they pretty much lived off the land here, but they were locally nomadic and very interesting because they would go basically from food source to food source, depending upon what went on in the year and what, what the climate was. And one of the key things that the coastal communities like the Tovimungas and the Chowingas um, what they would trade, they would trade abalone for acorns that were mostly in the inland tribes. Now one of the interactive things that's good here, we tried to basically replicate an old world compass. Even though this is not a real compass, but what it does do is you rotate around, you're going to notice that a little surprise is the North Star lights up in the far corner. And as you come around further, you're going to see the UR here which is where we are standing, lights up. And then as you come a little further, you're gonna see the phases of the moon down here light up. So it's a, it's a bit of a surprise and um, something that the kids I'm sure will have fun doing the spin around. So now and the other thing that, that we wanted to basically put a calendar of who lived here and sort of what transpired at different times. And the original people basically you could see lived here and they worked and lived off the land and the ocean. About 70% of all their food source came out of the ocean with the, with the communities that lived here originally. And when we talk about communities that the size of the community could be anywhere from 30 people to 300 people typically. And so the, the tribes or the communities would trade with each other depending upon what they thought might be valuable for not only the health and well-being, but decorative. Now, here's one of the first key years is 1542, Juan Cabrillo navigated these areas. So this is the first time that the Spaniards came through here and made contact with the first people. 1602, Sebastian Vizcaino came up from Mexico and basically traveled through the islands and the shorelines all the way up to Monterey. 1790, 
George Vancouver. He names Point Vincente, which is where we are. And if you go all the way down to the end, you get the SS Dominator, which you'll see here, basically crashed off into the rocks outside of Palos Verdes here. On to the next section, we're looking at the Sky Riders. And the Sky Riders are really the birds that fly overhead on this Pacific flyway that comes by us. Now, you gotta, you gotta understand that you're gonna get billions of birds that migrate every year across the U.S. And we have a group of birds here that are very interesting. And you can see that we have anywhere from Herman's Gull to the Spotted Sandpiper, Black Skimmer, all the way down to the Wimbrel. And you're gonna see these on this coastline. What's interesting about this is also that we give you an opportunity, learn a little bit more about the bird, the Spotted Sandpiper that you'll see. You'll also get a sense of what the actual egg size is. And you get a little bit of the story in the bobbling, wobbling gait distinguishes the spotted sandpiper. And you get the same kind of story with the black skimmer, egg size, and a little bit of info. And going all the way down through. Now, one of the little known facts is the fastest animal in the world is a peregrine falcon. It can dive, when it's diving for prey, it goes more than 200 miles an hour, which is pretty amazing feat, if you can imagine. And part of it is, it has lightweight bone system, and it, it is incredible to watch when you see it off the cliffs here at Palos Verdes. The next section we're gonna be talking about are the ancient mariners. The ancient mariner is the 30 million year old gray whale. Not actually 30 million years, but has been traveling this waters for over 30 million years and they've been going that 10 to 12,000 mile journey every year from Alaska down to Baja. And um, it's a pretty amazing kind of feat when you think about it. They spend three to four months up in Alaska area and they eat and get fat, really fat, and then they don't eat again except maybe nibble now and then as they travel down the coastline. Now typically off, off our shores here, we can spot anywhere between three to 4,000 of these gray whales coming by every year, either heading south or going north. Um, but it's a very interesting animal because it is adapted to these waters and it stayed in these waters. They were endangered for years, but now their population is back to over 25,000 and probably more. Just that's in the Pacific area, right, right along the coast. Um, now, what we're going to see are some of the pictures of the gray whale. We have them spy hopping, which spy hopping is a very unique kind of thing that we're not sure exactly what they're doing, but we're thinking that they come up out of the water and sort of check things out and see what's going on. Then you can see where they breach and they're going to go airborne. The gray whale typically doesn't do that, but it'll do it once in a while. And if you check out the skin on these things, you're going to see the free ride that other animals get with the barnacles and the lice. And then you can see there's the mother and the calf that are born travelers because they're going north to south or south to north constantly. And then you see, you can see the humans down here always checking them out, especially down the lagoons in Mexico. Now as we move across, you're going to see a baby here that has a little bit of the barnacles starting to build up, but not that much. And here's mom and calf as well. Now the 12,000 mile trip is pretty interesting because they'll go through, there's counts going on all up and down the coast in San Francisco area as well as here. And so they get a pretty good idea about how many are coming through every year. The other thing that they've done too is they've been able to identify the gray whale by its fluke, its tail. Each one is unique in and of itself, is like a fingerprint. Now for the last and I think one of the most fun panels that we've got is the superpowers of the gray whale. And what's really interesting is that uh, I think most people don't realize that the gray whales swim about three to five miles an hour constantly and you start to think about how do they rest, how do they do that? And one of the best ways for them to do that 
is by switching half their brain off. And so they rest basically part of their body and then swim with the other part, but they're still keeping their radar senses as in danger and they're constantly in motion. So they reduce the stress on part of their body while it's half asleep. Now, the other thing that I really like about this too is it's really difficult to get a feeling of what it's like to actually touch a gray whale. I've been lucky enough to do that. So we created an opportunity for kids especially to get a touch. And so you get this soft sort of rubbery surface and then you get these barnacles. And the barnacles are, are long for that free ride. And actually, uh, they, there's also a lice, an orange lice that gets attached to the gray whale as well. And it doesn't harm, but it's, they are cohabitating. And so they get from one area to the next together. Now, the other thing that's really interesting, we do have an actual gray whale skull, but some of the sounds that they make when they talk with each other and when they're trying to get around, If you were underwater, you would be able to hear some of these sounds. It's pretty amazing. Now, each whale species has their own set of sounds that they use. Now, the other thing that's different about the gray whale is it being a baleen whale, it doesn't have teeth like the sperm whale. So what it does typically when it eats, especially in Alaska, it'll dive down at a slight angle and it'll scoop up the sand and catch the amphipods, which is like a little shrimp-like character, and scoop it up into its mouth and filter the sand out of this baleen mouth, keep the food inside, and all the sand and water go out through the baleen. Now, you're gonna see this eye travel with you. They have stereocopic eyeballs on either side of their heads, and, and what that really helps them do is judge distance, and it also keeps keeps the surround around them. They're aware of any danger. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour today. I know when you can see it in person, it's gonna be the most fun. I said, one thing that I think is probably true for all of us, especially the docents, is we wanna make sure that we protect our environment and the habitat that we live in. We wanna make sure we can pass that along to our children and our grandchildren so they can enjoy it. So everybody out there, make sure you do your part. Take care of this planet.